good afternoon. And I am delighted uh, to be with you. And, and I am a great and longtime admirer. You know, the ethical, build, ethical Business Building the Future organization is exactly what the world needs. We need to think about the underlying issues for a kind of global transformation in the business sphere. And I'm so grateful for the work you all are doing. I think that one of the fundamental challenges that every human being and especially organizational and institutional leaders have is correctly understanding the time and the requirements of the age in which we live. I know that one of the guiding quotes of this uh, conference is to be anxiously concerned with the needs and the requirements of your time and to understand the reality of the environment in which you're operating. So let's take a look at that reality how it's shifting in ways that we may not fully appreciate. First of all, when you and I were born, 85% of the world was in extreme poverty. Today, that is only 9% of the world. So there has been a massive reallocation of wealth and a creation of a kind of global middle class that is shifting the organization of civil society, the development of institutions, commercial opportunities, uh, and the like. Uh, second, uh, there is, we are in the midst of what's, what uh, sociologists are calling the long peace. And that is, a, we are at a point which it has the least amount of violence in the history of the human species. Uh, and I mean, it is not a, a, uh, an elimination of violence, but it is an extreme reduction. Look, look, let me just give you a metric by which you can compare. In World War II in the United States, out of every 100,000 people, 700 died. And that's generally the metric for violence in a society. Now that's World War II, it's active shooting, that's one country. Today, it is 0.03. That is an extreme reduction of violence. And that is a global pattern in every sector of society. So we have this massive movement of people out of poverty. We have this long period of international uh, peace, no global uh, conflicts. And we have uh, this extraordinary reduction in violence driven by the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the rise of civil society, the uh, development of school systems, the development of uh, communal order. So the environment in which we are operating has changed radically. We do not fully appreciate the implications of that environment. We don't appreciate what's driving the change and therefore our response to the change is often misleading. Uh, the third force that is driving it is the rapid reproduction of knowledge. Uh, this year, for example, in, in medical knowledge, knowledge will double in, in medicine uh, several times this year, double several times this year. So everything we know will multiply radically. So when we ask ourselves about the dynamic of a world that is literally reorganizing itself before our very eyes, and the requirements of management and leadership and governance and institutional building under those circumstances, we are challenged to recognize that there is a kind of new formula of institutional leadership and so forth, and that the dynamics are, are so uh, different. A uh, first change in the dynamics is that strategy, which has been our, our holy grail, is demoted in terms of its influence. And the reason that it's demoted is that, not, is that uh, conditions are changing so rapidly that by the time the ink is dry on the strategy, it's obsolete. So it becomes not the central integrating principle of the way we think about going forward. It becomes a tool that we use to accomplish specific purposes. So if strategy is no longer the grail of management, but a tool to be used when appropriate, then you know what is the new galvanizing principle of leadership and management? Well, according to you know, scholars at, at, at places like Harvard and Dartmouth and uh, Christopher Bartlett, uh, Goshal and, and others, 
It is a spiritually galvanizing sense of purpose, of high purpose. And that spiritually galvanizing sense of purpose drives leadership in a completely different way. Uh, so for example, in a strategy driven organization, I tell you what to do, you do it, I hold you accountable, we measure the outcomes, we make adjustments, we go again. In a purpose driven organization, you know, it, it is about uh, fostering a sense of noble purpose. It is about uh, allowing you freedom to self-organize. It is about facilitating constant learning. It is about capturing those learnings and applying them to the further acceleration of the achievement of our purposes. It's about a fundamental redefinition of what the institution is. No longer just a financial entity, but now an entity that exists in a social context with communities and vendors and governments and, uh, and the like, a completely different set of challenges. Uh, so what is required of us under those circumstances? Well, the first is uh, that we develop a constant posture of learning. Um, and I would call that knowledge to the second power, that we are constantly oriented toward taking in new information, toward trying to understand it, and trying to ascertain what is true and factual. The second is that we learn skills in unifying the diversity of the members of our organization or community. And the reasons for this are multiple. Not only are we moving toward an elimination of differences among people, uh, what we call the oneness of humankind, but we, there is also now substantial clinical evidence that when we unify the diversity of the members of our organization, we get smarter, we solve problems more effectively, we innovate more effectively, and we drive financial and, and uh, social outcomes far more effectively. An organization that le leverages this diversity uh, um, effectively has a 35% greater opportunity to make money than an organization that doesn't. Organizations that use diversity effectively uh, are able to solve problems at a much higher level. And interestingly, uh, diverse groups of problem solvers, just uh, generalists with relevant knowledge, consistently outperform experts in their own fear, fear, uh, uh, area of expertise. And the reason is no assumptions, no boxes, no limitations. And if the driver of their problem solving processes is a consultative process where every voice is equal and the search for the truth is the primary uh, interest, then uh, not only do they do well, but the bigger the problem, the better they do. So the first uh, element is a constant uh, orientation toward learning. The second element is a constant um, ability to unify the diversity, to leverage all those differences of critical thought, of approach, of skills, of, of, of identities and cultural orientations, and all those factors that allow us to shed different kinds of light on a problem. And the third factor is the ability to foster trust and confidence. And if you can do those three things, if you can learn consistently, if you can unify the diversity of, of skills and knowledge and, and approaches and, and, uh, and the like, and if you can galvanize with trust, then you can get two significant outcomes. Uh, the first is social cohesion, what you and I might call unity. The ability to understand each other, the ability to cooperate, the ability to solve difficult problems, the ability to endure. And the second is the opportunity for economic prosperity, because our ability to solve problems, our ability to set aside our biases and see things uh, clearly, to follow the facts, as opposed to our assumptions or our preferences or our partisan orientations, allows us to more precisely identify what the challenge is and to identify the opportunities for meeting that challenge. You know, why is the spiritual element so important here? Well, first of all, everything we know tells us that people don't work for money. Money's important, we gotta pay the bills, but it's not the driving factor. People want to matter. 
They want the noble forces within them to be mobilized. They want to be able to make a contribution that, is, that, that gives them a sense that they are important in their sphere of, of action, that they make a critical contribution to the well-being of others. And interestingly, uh, the things that I do for myself, I'm happy about them. And I, and, I, and I benefit them. But the things that endure in my heart and in my mind are the things that I do for you. So when we foster understanding, when we come together and, and solve difficult, uh, confounding uh, problems, when we create innovation, when we build cooperation, when we make pro products and services that actually improve the lot and life of other people, then our sense that we have fulfilled some deep inner sense of purpose that uh, for which we were made, for which we were given all of these qualities of mind, of spirit, and of behavior, then it is fully utilized. And when we do that, not only do we make a transformational difference in our organizations and on our teams and in our communities, but we fulfill a sense of the reason we're here. Uh, 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 uh.